Hello and welcome to our look ahead to what the papers will be bringing us tomorrow. With us are Neil Midgley, media writer at the Daily Telegraph and uh, entrepreneur Scott Fletcher. Good to have you both here tonight. Let's take a look at uh, tomorrow's front pages then. Here's the Mail's headline. Champagne perks of NHS drugs watchdog nice. It says that the body has spent around £115,000 on expenses which have come out of the NHS budget. The paper says these splurges are coming at a time when nice is banning new drugs on the grounds that they're too expensive. The Express has a positive headline with the good news that we're all going to live longer. According to the Office for National Statistics, we're going to live an extra eight years, men up to 87 and women up to 90. The Independent continues its theme of the corruption of Britain with a secret report into how they say the criminal justice system has been infiltrated by organised crime gangs. The Independent sister paper, The Eye, has the battle begins for the soul of the NHS, pitting Labour and the Conservatives against each other as the two parties start to set out their stalls ahead of the general election. The Telegraph has a picture of the French president's alleged mistress, the actress Julie Gaillet, in a backless red dress. The Times also has a picture of the same French actress with the headline, We, oui, Mr President, as well as Labour's plan to improve the teaching profession. And finally, The Guardian leads with benefits. Chaos will lead to a new housing crisis. Well, that's where we'll start with The Guardian, um, saying that um, the universal credit is a time bomb which will lead to a rise in homelessness. This is a warning to Whitehall. Yes. Neil. Well, The Guardian have put the words, both the words crisis and time bomb in quotes in their headline and their stand first. I can't find either of those words in the quotes that they used in the story. Maybe they're further down inside the paper. It does seem to me one of those things to be scared of stories that aren't necessarily going to come true. The idea of universal credit, of course, is that it will replace a panoply of benefits, including housing benefit. Uh, and the idea, obviously, is to make work always pay, which is a great thing to do. But what in private, principle. in principle, what private landlords uh, are apparently saying, and there are several of them quoted in this story, are saying that if they, they can't get the money direct from the government, as they often do on housing benefit now, uh, that they will stop renting flats and houses out to uh, benefit claimants. Because it requires the benefit claimants to, to, budget. Make, to, to budget and yes. hand over their, their, their monthly uh, uh, rent. Yeah, and that's, that's also part of Ian Duncan Smith's scheme, is that the benefit will be paid monthly rather than weekly, which obviously will save on administration costs. But some people but, find it very difficult to manage a monthly budget, don't they, if they've been used to working mm -hmm. on a weekly wage? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this story, I, I'm, I'm torn because I think, you know, on the one hand, people should take responsibility for their own money and their own mm. budgeting. But on the other hand, if this leads to private landlords pulling out of this sector, then, I mean, we were talking earlier about building new houses and this will just exacerbate the problem. So, it, you know, it, it, could, it could be one of those stories where, like you say, certain alarm bells ringing, but you know, maybe, maybe there's something in it that we, we do need to be careful about the way it's rolled out. When you drill down into the, into the detail, you get to the, to the end of the story on the front page. As far as I can see, there's no difference in the way that landlords are going to be treated under the government's current plans for universal credit. So if two rent payments are missed, that's the current trigger for housing benefit to be paid direct to the landlord. And apparently it's going to be the same under universal credit. So what these people are complaining about apparently is the message that the government is somehow sending out. But who's complaining here? Is it the landlords? Private landlords, yeah. And they house a million people. Yeah, and we, we have to it's remember a lot, a lot of these private landlords are, uh, you know, maybe have one or two houses and if they're reading these sort of headlines mm. then they may just decide to leave mm. it all alone. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I rented into this sector man, many years ago, one, one house I moved out of when I, when I moved south for a while, believe it or not. And um, you know, I had a real problem with mm. the council in collecting the rent because they didn't pay me direct at the time. Yeah. And, you know, so you can understand how maybe some of these you know, smaller landlords, that, you know, that, that people like you and me, yeah. who, who are you know, just trying to rent out maybe second properties, and this sort of headline could put them off rent into to the social sector. But you're sceptical that it will even come to fruition, that this problem will even happen, because the mechanism will ultimately mechanism, be the same. As, as far as I understand it, the mechanism will be the same. So the, as far as I understand it, at the moment, all things being equal, you get your housing benefit paid to you, the claimant, and you then pay your rent with it. If your landlord set, tells the government that you, you've missed two payments, then they get the money direct from the government. And as far as I understand it from this story, that's going to be the same under the government's current plans for universal credit. Let's move on and look at the Times. Labour will tell teachers to improve 
or face the sack? Well, we've just been hearing from the National Union of Teachers uh, just a few moments ago. We were speaking to Kevin Courtney, their Deputy uh, General Secretary, and his concern with this is that it won't go hand in hand, Scott, with teachers being offered proper, high quality professional development throughout their career, you can't sort of pull the ladder up without offering people the opportunity to improve. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the headlines here are, are talking about the, the, the NUT guy earlier was saying he, he waits to hear that detail. And I, 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 th I think, though, in any profession, then there should be that continuous improvement. I think we should be you know, holding teachers to account on the quality of what they're delivering. I mean, I, I spoke a lot about young people you know, and, and getting them into apprenticeships and, and teaching our young kids about computer computer coding and you know maybe not focusing on things like handwriting but maybe typing so that we can compete with some of these um, you know these other countries around the world who really put those skills into into kids and if, if our teachers can't offer those skills through the system to, to the young people then maybe we do need to start putting things in place to to monitor it. I just wonder what Labour thought it was doing while it was in power for 13 years. <laughs> it's interesting now that we've got a fixed term parliament and we know that there's an election coming in less than 18 months time suddenly these very voter friendly no nonsense policies are starting to come out we've got Andy Burnham in the shadow health secretary in another of the papers doesn't talking mean, about though, plans for the NHS doesn't mean though that any of these policies they're talking about now will actually be in their manifesto no, it doesn't. come the day does it doesn't it? Uh, but labor has has just no history of trying to improve uh, teaching but. during its last uh, stint in power i mean to my mind the devaluation of state education and the, and, the, and the consequent decrease in social mobility um, were, were the biggest crime of Labour's time in office. Well, aren't they entitled then to, to try to get it right this time, to do something a little bit more robust and, and to say to parents, we recognise that something needs to be done to, to, to weed out the weakest? Well, they are. and I think I'm probably, in my turn, then entitled to be a bit sceptical <laughs> about whether they actually will. Well, they're damned the if face... they do, they're damned if they don't well, do. Well, in the face of the inevitable, I mean, the teaching unions are not... If, if this would genuinely lead to bad teachers being <clears> fired, the teaching unions simply will not stand but, for it. But not just bad teachers, but actually get, getting the skills into the teachers that we need for modern society and a, mo and a modern, skill, you know, skilled young person. But the, the, the point that the NUT were making is that lots of people realise that teaching is not for them. They don't need to be sacked. They recognise it for themselves and they exit the profession. But these figures don't tell you about those people who make the decision for themselves. Absolutely. We'd but have to ask our teachers about that. I mean, that, you know, that would be... You know, they manage those skills. And you know, I think at the, the end of the day... Uh, you know, I'll keep going back to it, but we need to teach our kids the right things for, for, uh, for industry. Let's look at the couple of stories um, here. The, French, the story of the French president, Francois Hollande's alleged affair with an actrice hits several of the front pages. Um, the Times shows uh, Julie Gaillet giving a very Gallic shrug, uh, whereas the Telegraph, um, well, shows a little bit more of her to us in a rather glamorous dra dress there. We can see her tattoo as well. Um, this is a, such a, it's a very interesting uh, story, isn't it, looking at it from Britain? Because we get sort of rather sort of vexed about these things. And traditionally, the French yeah. have just sort of allowed politicians to, to get on with things pri yes. privately and not, not worry too much. It seems to be changing. It, it does. Uh, and it, it, it's interesting to think how it would play out, how this kind of story... We haven't had a good political sex scandal for quite a while now, have we? I mean, you know, when you think about the good old, going back, back to the good old days of the last Tory government and David Mellor and his Chelsea kit <laughs> Chelsea. and, you know, we had some, oh, yes. we had some great tabloids. Yeah, I remember yeah. those days. We had some great tabloid stories. I mean, this girl, in, to my mind, needs woman. a root stone. but... She needs a root stone. That's the only old comment that, you but, have. But she's not dressed in Chelsea kit. I mean, the French... You know, they have a, a much more glamorous, but they did je ne sais out. quoi. <laughs> they? they did step out for croissants. Yeah, they yeah. Sent, no, no, I they didn't. They, they uh, oh, they didn't. They, they oh, okay. sent the security guard. Ah, okay. To, okay. You know, bodyguard went out to do, fetch croissants. Do we actually know it was him yet? I mean, he well, apparently he was in his. Uh, he's not helmet, denied right? it, has he? Okay, well, maybe I think he would deny it. Yeah. But it's, it's social media have meant, made this uh, a much bigger deal in France. I mean, the television stations are still leaving it well alone because of the privacy laws. But it, just as we've seen here, social media, it's, it all takes yeah, on a life of its own. You can't control it now, can you? No. No, not so easily, anyway. They might try. Uh, the Daily Mail. 
Champagne perks of NHS drugs watchdog. This is nice, so the people who decide which drugs we're going to get and what, we, what can be afforded. Apparently, having spent £115,000 uh, on taxpayer-funded credit cards in the past two and a half years, this is the kind of thing that really gets people's goat, doesn't it? Because we're supposed to be in a time of austerity and it looks as if people are spending mm. money on luxury items at the taxpayer's expense. Well, well it's a great headline, isn't it? But when you read the story, actually, £115,000 over two years and only £5,000 spent on luxury hotels. It's about 200 quid a month spent on hotels, £50,000 a year spent on credit cards. People have expenses that they use these credit cards on. But I think the bigger story, as you read further down, is actually there's, there's 137,000 of these yeah. in circulation. These credit cards? Yeah, exactly. Gov Government-funded credit cards. I mean, I, it, I, I can't imagine, under current circumstances, there are many, I mean, you probably know best than me, many private sector employers who are dishing out credit yeah. cards to their, to their staff yeah, and for expenses. 1.1 billion spent on those 137,000 credit cards. That's a, that is a huge amount Much of money. And how they manage that and how you they claim it. You need a whole it. new staff, don't you, just yeah. to go through the bills every well, month? Well, well, maybe they should switch to the way most of the private sector do it and also, people put it on yeah. their own personal credit cards and claim yeah. it and justify it. Does it I mean, mean if, that the if, bill comes down, though? Possibly. Well, the bill comes down to the extent that if, if, the, if the item is on someone's personal credit card, then the onus is on them to claim it back from the employer. If someone puts something a bit dodgy on a card which has been issued and paid for by their employer, in this case the government, it's much more difficult for the employer then to try and claw that back yeah. from it, the employee. It, well, it's already been spent, hasn't dodgy. it, yeah. at that point? Yeah, the money's gone. I hope they're listening. <laughs> Very good ideas. Um, the Express. Britons to live eight years longer. Great news, oh. says the front page. Is it? Says, I don't know, I feel quite tired just reading that. Oh. We will be top of the lifespan league. Do you want to be, Neil? Well, it says we're going to gonna live eight years uh, longer. Men will live to the uh, age of 87 on average. I mean, I'm just looking forward now to the, my life between the ages of 79 and 87. <laughs> and wondering, <laughs> wondering if, if those, those brilliant eight years are actually great news. And, and you, it's so fantastic. I'm, I'm really pleased that you're making plans already. Well, how's your pension looking for those years? Because I don't well, think any exactly. of us really, you know, and that's that. The, the, uh, exactly. I mean, this is a big, the big issue here is how do we afford pensions and, and the NHS? You know, a lot of the other headlines about the NHS and the cost rising and et cetera, and how we're going to manage, manage that, you know. And th this just basically gives us a, a, a bigger problem. But yeah, maybe maybe the fun bit in the story is uh, you know we will be underwater by then because we seem to have you know on the front page here Paul Daniels' house underwater. Yes, we'll have a look at him in a minute if we can. Um, but as you say, there's so many implications about us all living longer. I mean, the impact it's going to have on the NHS. We're already seeing the state pension age is being pushed up mm. and up yep. and up. I mean, it, I mean it's great yeah. if you're healthy, but it's all about quality and, of and, life and, as well. And isn't again, it? there's a public-private sector thing here because. Obviously, private sector employers now almost entirely offer defined contribution pensions, which means that what you put in uh, dictates what you get yeah. out, whereas public sector employers still giving defined benefit pension schemes, which means that they, they promise you a certain amount on retirement, which is literally writing a blank cheque on behalf of the poor old taxpayers, again, in the private sector. And that would be a huge cultural change if they were to, to, to change would. that over in the public well, sector. Well, I mean, we've seen that at the BBC. There was a massive, you know, there were strikes and uh, or a very great deal of anger here at the BBC when the management tried to change the pension scheme a couple of years ago. They did change it. And, and they did change In the end, they did change it. They didn't change it as radically as they but initially proposed. And many of these pension schemes haven't actually got a fund to fund them, so we, mm. we end up, we're going to pay out yeah. of future I mean, that was the difference with the BBC, was that they yeah. actually did have some assets yeah. to pay. And some of the councils have their it. own funds, but most... Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that was the problem. There was a uh, deficit. But what I will say is that we're always complaining, aren't we, that we're, the, we're never at the top of a league table. It looks uh, like we're going to be. Yeah. But we still won't be happy. We're going to be miserable for longer. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to being miserable with you. Uh, the, another story on the Daily Express, which, which Scott just um, referred to here, is uh, Paul Daniels and his wife, Debbie McGee, live in what would normally be probably a very beautiful house on the banks of the River Thames. Well, and you can hardly see a lot of it because it, it's underwater. It reminds me of um, Towin in North Wales when the, the banks... Uh, going back about 20 years and all the all the caravans were underwater. I mean, that's what the photo looks like. It does like. look and, like yeah, that and, first and this, sight, doesn't and it? And I assume this is in a very wealthy area. I mean, it's a, such suburb. a sad picture. There's two little 
topiaried hedges that look like corkscrews that clearly they're once yes were, were, yeah once on each side of the front door and they're just sort of they've just been knocked over to one side in a but if you're going to live next to the thames well i know it's what yeah. a lot of people aspire to do i'm sure a lot of mm. people were thinking mm. uh, about whether that's really a very sensible idea until we get the flood defenses sorted yeah. and out. should the rest of us be paying for flood defenses for millionaires row question mark Ooh. Ooh, controversial yeah. I think, fortunately we don't have time to tackle that one <laughs> i'm going to very quickly go back to the daily telegraph pressure for a perfect wedding threatening marriage itself the growing pressure on couples to have a perfect and very expensive yeah. perfect wedding has become one of the biggest threats to marriage itself this is um Lord Williams, uh, Rowan Williams, who's of course the former Archbishop of Canterbury, I'm sure he and the current Archbishop have been saying something similar. I mean, you lose sight of why you're getting married when you sort of bog down in, you know, what your dress is going to be like, how yeah. big the cake is. Yeah, I mean, it's like Christmas, isn't it? It started off being a religious, in this case, ceremony for Christmas celebration. And it's become this great sort of consumer festival. Of course, come March of this year, we're going to start having gay weddings. And if you think straight people have had a massive hoopla uh, and have put themselves under a lot of pressure, wait till you see the kind of extravaganzas that we gays are going to subject you to. You've done it. You've done it. You've managed to say gay man from the Gay leads. gypsy wedding? I mean, where could we go? Oh. But there's a huge business opportunity for people in weddings, Scott. Massive. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'd say about weddings, you know, nowadays for young people, what's in it for them? You know, and we've, you know, we don't have a tax system that supports marriage. We, you know, there's, there's all this cost going with it. Yeah. So I think, you know, we've got to look at that. Do we want the family unit to be something as a, as a country we support or not? A case for eloping, perhaps. Uh, maybe. I didn't suggest it. Uh, that's it for the papers tonight. It's been très amusant, I think we can say, can't we? <laughs> thank you to Neil and thank you to Pleasure. Scott. Thank you very much. Hope you'll come back again. You've got to. Well, you'll have me. Uh,